But I want to end with this last point, and that is that to, for us to carry the adventure of compassion and love in a newly constituted world, I think the one ingredient is courage. I believe, having lived 78 years, that I think courage is the first sign of spirit. Courage, large heart, cur large, a big heart. That's how I began talking about God is delighted to watch your soul enlarge, and your heart enlarge. That's what courage is all about. How do we develop courage? How many people here have ever been in a class called Courage 101? <laughs> courage 202. We're not teaching it. This is, I think, how you teach courage, through stories of courage. Stories of courage, like Dr. King, knowing that his life was threatened, and he was asked, how can you march when you know there are people trying to shoot you? And his answer was, you have to love something more than the fear of death if you're going to live. That's courage. And he lived it, and he died at 39 years of age. By the way, the weekend he died, he had a, an engagement with Thich Nhat Hanh and Thomas Merton. They were going to have a retreat together at Merton's monastery. And a few days before, King called Merton and said, I'm sorry, you have to cancel. We'll get a rain check. I have to march with the, the uh, garbage collectors in Memphis this weekend. Sorry about that. And Merton wrote in his journal after the murder that he said what, what fate this was. That, uh, that if he had gone on the retreat, he, he would not have been shot at that time. So to tell the stories of the courageous ones, this is how we develop our own courage. So let me tell you a couple of stories. The year I was silenced, which by the way was the only sabbatical I've ever had in my life, <laughs> but, but the Vatican didn't pay me for the sabbatical, I had to hustle to get money, but anyway, uh, it was a sabbatical because I wasn't allowed to work. Uh, one thing I did was go to Brazil to be with um, Leonardo Boff, who had been silenced that year, and to be with Bishop Cassidialaga, an amazing human being, bishop in the Amazon, a real saint, a very close friend of Archbishop Romero. And as I was there that week with uh, Cassidialaga, uh, there was a retreat going on for the church workers in the Amazon forest, about 200 of them came. And um, one night they had a, a mass, a very simple mass in a gymnasium. And at the end, they were invited, everyone to come up and light a candle and name three people you know who were tortured and murdered working here trying to defend the rainforest and the rainforest Indians. Everyone went up there and lit a candle and spoke three names. And afterwards, a guy came up to me and said, the hard part was limiting it to three. I know at least 10 off the top of my head. And it just blew me away how much courage there is in us, in the human person. These are ordinary people in jeans and t-shirts. And they were living that life day by day, day in and day out, because they loved. Because compassion was real for them. Because they believed that death would not be the last word. And then there is my sister, Dorothy Stang, who I alluded to, I think, yesterday. But when she went back to, after going through our program, she went back to Brazil. She knew her life was in danger because she was a leader. And her, her family said, don't go. It's too dangerous. And her, her community said, don't go. It's too dangerous. But this is what she wrote. I don't want to flee. Nor do I want to abandon the battle of these farmers who live without any protection in the forest. They have the sacrosanct right to aspire to a better life on land where they can live and work with dignity while respecting the environment. The death of the forest is the end of our lives. So she did return. And one day she was walking alone down a dirt road, and three men with a machine gun came out. And she had just time to take out her Bible. She opened it up to the Beatitudes, started to read, and they gunned her down. Paid for, of course, by big landowners and multinational corporations and all the rest that are now having a field day in Brazil all over again. There's a picture of her body lying down, face down, with blood. You know, 
Being a martyr isn't about having a golden halo around your neck and being all cleaned up and spruced up like the icons last night. You have to see things like this. This a 73-year-old woman. And when they had a funeral, one of the peasants stood up and he said, Sister Dorothy, we're not burying you. We are planting you. Well, no, it's, I'm, it's beauty. I'm crying out of beauty. Beauty moves me. Well, lives are beautiful. And deaths are too. And I'll tell you this secret story about Thomas Merton. The day he left for his trip to Asia, he spoke to a woman whom he was very close to. And the woman said, well, goodbye. We'll see you in a couple of months. Have a wonderful trip. And Merton said, I'm sorry. Uh, this is goodbye. I will not see you again. He said, as long as I was in the monastery, I was protected. But I know that I will not return. So he had this intuition. And we've been lied to for 50 years by a lot of people, including the Catholic press and even the monastery, about his death. He stepped out and died from taking a shower. It's absurd. And this book that came out totally proves it's absurd. <clears throat> I want to tell one more story about courage. Fred Shuttlesworth. Fred Shuttlesworth was a civil rights organizer, black minister in um, Birmingham. And unlike King, he was not educated, he was not middle class, he was street priest, street minister. He's the one who convinced King to fill the jails with teenagers. King didn't want to. But Fred said to him, look, Martin, the adults have been in jail a month. They're going to lose their jobs if they don't go to work. We've got to fill in with someone. It's a teenager. So King re, uh, relented and allowed that to happen. And of course, that helped save the whole movement. But um, Fred Shuttlesworth, the, the, uh, the, the, the sheriff, O'Connor, arrested his two children, eight and 10 years old, put them in jail. The Ku Klux Klan beat him twice with chains. And then one day, the Ku Klux Klan blew up his house, and he was in it. The whole roof caved in, but he walked out alive. So about 10 years ago, I was invited to do a dialogue with Fred Shuttleworth on ecology and racism at the Civil Rights uh, uh, Museum, at, uh, which was in Birmingham, built right across the street from that African-American church where six girls were blown up on a Sunday morning. So before we went on, we were having a simple lunch together, dividing a sandwich, and I said to him, Fred, I have a question for you. Where do you get your courage? And this was his answer. He said, you can call it courage, but I don't. I call it trust. Now, to me, that lesson is everything. First of all, because it's coming from an authentically courageous human being who's tapped into his courage, as all of us are capable of doing. We all have courage in us. Trust. The word that we've been using for faith in the gospel has been mistranslated. It's not faith. Jesus didn't say, go your way, your faith has healed you. He said, pistuin, go your way, your trust has healed you. And then faith has now become this big bottleneck of doctrines and dogmas and obedience things and all this. Trust is the key. Do we trust our calling, our vocation to be here? Do we trust the work that we're doing? Do we trust that we're up to that work? All these, I think, are the, the, the questions that circle the building up of courage, that big heart. And so I wanted to leave you with those four stories about courage because um, nothing is going to be accomplished that needs to be accomplished in these next 12 years. Uh, without courage. As Gandhi said, if you want to be a leader, be prepared for mountains of suffering. Mountains of suffering. That doesn't mean that you dwell on the suffering. King didn't dwell on the fear or the suffering or the death. He fell more deeply in love with the project, more deeply in love with his people, more deeply in love with racial justice and ending segregation. Just like Aquinas says that, that um, acedia, 
the, the spiritual sin of, of, of not having energy, we have a word for it today, couch potato-itis, <laughs> that, that, that spiritual sin of, of passivity, what's a cure for couch potato-itis or acedia? Aquinas says, zeal comes. Zeal is the opposite of couch potato-itis or acedia. Zeal comes from an intense experience of the beauty of things. An intense experience of the beauty of things. In other words, but gives you the energy to keep going and to make good things happen and to turn lemons into lemonade and all the rest. What gives you the energy is you're in love. Just like Teilhard says, that we're, we are having daily an intense experience of the beauty of things. It may be the beauty of the cosmos, it may be the beauty of a of an animal, of a child, of a song, of whatever it is, we're here to defend and to stand up for. So that's my, my uh, offering in uh, response to Elia's wonderful talk and in response to the theme of this weekend, which is the science of love, or might I add, and compassion. Thank you.